afternoon. My name is uh, Dr. Wong Teck Lee. I'm a consultant cardiologist, and today I'm going to talk about healthy aging involving our environment. So let me share my screen. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about our Mother Earth. So before I start, I want you to do an exercise. It's a, a competition uh, with yourself to see how long you can hold your breath. So if all of you are ready, you take a deep breath in and hold it and see how long you can hold it. So you all get ready. You sit in a comfortable position. And then I'm going to start the timer. And when timer starts, you take a deep breath and hold it. Okay, so all of you uh, get ready. So take a deep breath in and hold it. Okay, hey, so some of you can hold more than 30 seconds. Some of you can hold more than one minute. So if, if you can type in the chat box to see how long you can hold your breath. So in my previous uh, presentation elsewhere, I have told the audience to hold the breath as much as you can. And when you cannot stand it, you use your mental power to hold it another 5 to 10 seconds more. So later on, you can practice on your own. You take a deep breath and hold it. When you physically cannot tahan, then you use your power, your will, to hold on for another 5 to 10 seconds. And at the end of it, you see how you feel. Okay, I'm going to move to my next slide. Hang on. Eh? Okay, so this is exercise is to it's not just to to see your your power of uh, holding breath, but it is related to the the talk that I'm giving now. So I want you to sit back and I want you to watch a movie. Okay, so this movie uh, will give you some idea of what I'm talking about today.
Okay, so thank you for paying attention. So there's a principle of balance in medical terms is homeostasis. In the uh, Chinese tradition, they have this yin and yang. So if you remove the life force, which is uh, air, water, soil, the sun, it will remove our health. So the top of the food chain, the apex predator, used to be the lions and the tigers. The apex predator now is a human. So can we survive as an apex predator? So our earth is uh, formed by these uh, four elements and it can cause landslide, uh, air cause typhoon and fire and also flooding. So the four elements are not in balance and the earth is uh, facing this disaster. So this is a very important uh, scientific fact. It shows that if our temperature increase by one degree Celsius. It can cause all this uh, extreme climate change and we've been seeing it for the last 10 years. And if the temperature is more than two degrees Celsius, about one million of species in the ecosystem will face extinction. Three degrees Celsius, 80% of the icebergs will melt leading to massive climate refugees. Four degrees Celsius will cause uh, drought affecting every over 40% of the inhabited land and the sea level will rise to about three to six feet. And from five to six degrees Celsius, most of the living creatures will be extinct. So the bottom line is 1.5 degrees Celsius. So you keep this number in mind because uh, uh, later on, there's a climate clock uh, looking at this number because the 1.5 degrees Celsius will be the point of no return if we are not going to change anything. So I want you to pay attention to this uh, uh, change. Uh, you can see in the past, our temperature has maintained very stable for the last 2,000 years. So the last 2,000 years has been uh, stable and, and the last 200 years. So the change for the last 200 years is the 
industry uh, revolution. The industry revolution has caused the temperature to rise about one degree Celsius. And uh, in the medieval, uh, I mean, from the 1400 to 1800, you can see a, a, a dip in the temperature, they call it a little ice age. And there's some studies uh, from all these different uh, centers has found that our temperature for the last uh, 200 years has gone up. So these are the uh, industrial uh, revolution where the temperature has gone up to about one degree uh, up to now uh, compared to about uh, with the, for the baseline of uh, 1950s or 1980s, the temperature has increased about one degree Celsius. So if you have time, you go and Google this, the climate clock, the climate climate crisis uh, countdown clock. This is a timeline that no government is uh, yet willing to commit, but we must do what science and justice demand so that and uh, not, not what the elected politicians uh, deem convenient. And we mustn't pretend that we have more time than we do. So this you can uh, find out more uh, at the end of this talk. So this, uh, the, the, the climate clock, have uh, two parts to it. First one is a deadline. So it is uh, the last time when I look at this uh, clock, every day it changed. It says that we have less than six years in our global carbon budget that gives two thirds chance of staying under the critical threshold of 1.5 degrees Celsius. So this is a critical number, 1.5 degrees Celsius. So six years is about year 2030. If you are not going to do anything, uh, we are going to go on a on the point of no return. The, the, the other side of the clock is called the lifeline. So the deadline says that if you have only six years left for the 1.5 degrees uh, global warming, uh, the other side it says that it is, look, it is looking at the renewable energy transition. It tracks the progress in shifting from fossil fuels to renewable energy. And uh, these are the carbon budget uh, countdown based on the current carbon dioxide emissions. So what is a reason for the environmental changes. This is uh, some of the reason. Uh, the biggest reason is the uh, greenhouse uh, gas emission, carbon dioxide and methane. So uh, this we learn in, uh, in chemistry, but these are the two important gases and I will tell you why uh, one of them is more important. Number two is deforestation, pollution, air, water and soil, overpopulation and resource consumption, industrialization and also urbanization and agriculture uh, and also farming and plastic uh, pollution. So the big one that caused environmental change is this. And you can see that all this has uh, accelerated after the industrial revolution. Before that, this is not a big problem. So now I want you to focus on the, the carbon dioxide parts per million. So, so we can see here, the number of uh, 500 is uh, 400 is an uh, important uh, numbers that we are looking at. So for the last 1,000 years, you can see that the temperature has started to come up. And the uh, important cutoff that you, you look at is the uh, Industrial Revolution. And uh, you can see that uh, the, the carbon dioxide uh, concentration has gone up and also the temperature has gone up for the last 1,000 years. So the big uh, change is the industrial revolution. So that's last 1,000 years. Now we look at 10,000 years. So for last 10,000 years, the common dioxide had been remained stable, slightly climbing out from 260 to 280, only 20 parts per million increase for the last 5,000 years. But for the last 200 years, you can see that it has gone up from 280 to, to 400. And from 1,000 to 10,000, now we are looking at 60 million years. So, so the cutoff that I want you to focus on is the 400 parts per million of uh, carbon dioxide. In the history of our Earth, it has gone up to 1,600. So the area like in the, in the, in the North Pole and South Pole, uh, maybe all the humans can accumulate there when the carbon dioxide has gone up and the temperature has, has gone up. So this scale is not uh, uh, proportionate, but for the last uh, 10 million years, you can see the, the common dioxide has remained the same 
and uh, it's only for the last 200 years it has gone up to 400. <coughs> if we are not going to change anything, it will go up to the level uh, according to the graph expon exponentially. <coughs> and then if you if you remember from history, our human uh, revolution, evolution, uh, we only start to be bipedal around 18 million years ago. And the one that we study in, uh, in during medical school, Australopithecus in, in Africa, is only 3.5 million years ago. And this has increased, the evolution has changed, and, and the, the modern humans is only the last 35,000 years. So the Nedantos is about 70,000 years ago. So human, modern human, only appear 35,000 years compared to the, 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 the life of, of the Earth. So the only change is the last 200 years, the, the, the carbon dioxide has gone up so much and also the temperature has increased. So what is the... Uh, what is the reason for the killer gases? Sorry. These are the main one, the carbon dioxide. Uh, wait, let me close this. Okay, the first one is uh, carbon dioxide by burning fossil fuel, deforestation, and land use, methane, because of the livestock, rice paddies, uh, landfills, natural gas processing. So for those countries that produce uh, natural gas like Malaysia, the production of the uh, natural gas will also produce a lot of methane, nitric oxide from the fertilizer, manual, and also fluorinated gas. So you may say that these are the, the top two causes of uh, killer gases for causing uh, global warming. So, okay, let me see my slide. It's not moving. Uh, okay, so let me stop sharing and come back again. Okay, so uh, you can see here that uh, for last uh, uh, 2,000 years, the amount of all these uh, killer gases like carbon dioxide and methane has uh, gone up. Okay, so the 400 is a cutoff for carbon dioxide. Uh, and these are the two main factors. So the greenhouse gases, the main contribution of the greenhouse gases, uh, you may think that it's uh, transportation from all the cars and lorries that you drive, but it's not. It's actually the livestock industry. It contributed about 51% of the greenhouse uh, gases. So UN reported that the meat industry is one of the most significant contributors to the, today's uh, serious uh, environmental problems. And compared to the world population, 8 billion of us, yeah, 33 billion of uh, poultry, 1.5 billion of uh, cows and, uh, and, and sheep. So in terms of Malaysia, they have done a, a publication, quarterly bulletin from Bank Negara Malaysia. It shows Malaysia import and only forms about 24% of our total food supplies. As of August 2019, Malaysia's food imports was 34.2 billion. That was about four years ago. So the number, I mean, the, the cost has increased so much because of our, uh, our lower currency and also the cost of food. And you can see here, in 2018, we import about 40% of our rice and 70% of our beef supply. And look at the numbers that uh, we spent cereal, coffee, feedstock, vegetables is at least three to four to seven billion. That's a lot of money. And if you look at the malicious uh, self-sufficiency uh, ratio, uh, we can only self-sufficient in these blue things because we produce 100%. All these are uh, cucumber, brinjal, spinach, eggs, long beans, all that. But these are things that we are short of. So we have to import like tuna, crab, mackerel, coconut. Uh, coconut, we are uh, tropical countries. We have to import coconut. Rice as well, cabbage, chili, beef, and mango and mutton. And if you and and these are statistics in Malaysia, and we found that the amount of meat that we eat, the majority are from the poultry, fifty percent. Uh, the rest are beef, pork, and uh, sheep. And okay, this is a very uh, busy slide, 
it shows that what type of uh, food that we take contribute to greenhouse uh, gas emission. So the first one is the beef, the beef for, for their meat. It shows that uh, the green color is uh, the use of land. The brown color, it shows that the methane production from cows and land combustion for grazing. So the cows for meat produce a lot of methane. So why is methane so important? The next one is a lamb and mutton, also produce a lot of methane. So lamb and, and beef are animals that's called ruminants. So they consume all this uh, grass and it's, it's fermented in their, in, their, in their intestine. So the fermentation produce a lot of methane. Okay, the next one is cheese, uh, beef, chocolate, coffee, prawns, uh, palm oil. So the Western country have complained that the palm oil is the one that caused global warming. But you can see that the amount of contribution is, is not even 10% uh, of, the, of the meat industry. So it's not the palm oil. Uh, pork. Okay, you can see here, pork and poultry, even though they are animals that we consume, but they are not ruminants. So they don't produce a lot of uh, methane. So the methane are those that uh, consume the grass and also uh, fermenting in their, in their stomach. Uh, olive oil, fish, eggs, rice. Okay, rice, uh, it produces a lot of methane because of flooding of the, of the paddy fields. When you flood, then some of this uh, is an anaerobic fermentation. So when there's water with the paddy field below, all this uh, organic material is fermented without oxygen. So when it's fermented without oxygen, it produces a lot of methane. And uh, so, so those that has low greenhouse gases are all these are plant-based food like ground nuts, wheat, rice, tomato, maize, cassava, soy milk, peas, bananas, root vegetables, apples, and all that. So we can see that those that increase uh, greenhouse uh, emission are the meat industry, especially those who are ruminants. So methane is so important because it's twenty-three times more effective at trapping heat in the atmosphere than carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is important, but methane is more powerful. Now imagine that you have a, a 100 kilogram of uh, carbon dioxide, the methane is uh, 2,300 kilogram of, uh, of effect. So the cows, they, they burp and also they fart. All these are gases that contribute to greenhouse uh, emission. So a, a single cow, produce between 154 to 264 pounds of methane per year, and 1.5 million of uh, cattle produce uh, so much of uh, methane. So uh, a cow produce 3,000 kilograms equivalent. And also methane is times 23, is equal to 3,000 kilograms of carbon dioxide, compared to human, is about 10%. So human also produce uh, gases, but it's 10% compared, uh, compared to cows. And uh, mature trees is uh, you need about eighty three to one hundred forty three uh, mature trees to convert this to to oxygen. So the human need about eight trees to I mean uh, about ten percent of this amount to 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 process this carbon dioxide. So a lot of uh, land clearings to to grow food and also feed stock for all these animals. So for the past 10 years, every minute a forest equivalent to 11 football fields is lost to land clearing for animal farming. 40% of the grains produced in the world is used for animal feed. So humans consume more meat now. So if you look at the global use of uh, land product, uh, food production, so only 30% of the land, but 71% are habitable and 46% uh, are used for agriculture. And if you look at this, Amount that's used for agriculture, 77% are used for livestock, meat, and dairy. Only 23%. But, but of this proportion, uh, the global calorie supply, 82% come from plant-based. Only 18% come from meat. And uh, protein supply, 63% come from the plant-based uh, supply. So I spoke about the four elements, uh, the land, the water, and and also uh, the rest. So the water consumption, if you produce one kilogram of potato, you need about 100, 100 liters of water. And one kilogram of rice needs about 4,000 liters. And uh, one kilogram of cow's meat, about 13,000 of water. So 
with all these facts, some of you here may, may, may find that this is not really relevant for your practice as a doctor. And you say this is may not be my business because uh, it's, it's none of my uh, duty to all this. And and you don't really care because at the moment you can still live happily and uh, Malaysia still is a very fertile country to, to live in. So what is the consequences of all this uh, global warming? It can cause the temperature change and greenhouse effects. And the climate change can cause heat waves, droughts, uh, storms and floods and the melting ice and glaci glaciers. So certain countries like Singapore, uh, they may be covered by uh, a large amount of sea, sea level and ocean acidification. So when the carbon dioxide absorbed by the ocean, it result in uh, increased acid and the corals and the shellfish will be dead and the, and the habitat of uh, fishes will be affected. Uh, biodiversity loss, disruption of our ecos ecosystem and extinction of many, many species, health impacts, all the changing of disease patterns, or chronic disease and infectious disease, and agriculture disruption because of the abuse in uh, crop use, uh, food shortages and economic challenges, and water scarcity. But the more important things that may affect you as an individual is the economic consequences. Because of this global warming, the production will increase in cost and uh, that will cause economic losses, damage to infrastructure because of all this disaster, and increased cost of adaptation and disaster recovery, and also social disruption. So population will be displaced and resource uh, conflicts because of limited resources and social unrest arising from climate-induced uh, changes. Okay, sorry. So in Malaysia, you can see some of this uh, landslide strategy because of uh, uh, accumulation of uh, rainfalls in in certain times, and all these uh, uh, trees as uh, removed and growing uh, human encroachment to to the to the forest, and that also caused. Yes. Okay. I bring it down. Is it okay? Close it. Uh, uh, let me see. Uh, I can't close it. Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, how about here? Is it okay? Uh, is this a small zoom box or a big one? Okay. Um, so this is um what. KL resident in Klang Valley produce about 3,500 tons of rubbish. It can cover up so much of uh, the Twin Towers and also illegally dump a lot of uh, rubbish and alum flora product collects about 130 tons of uh, fat and grease. Okay, so this is a, a important slide which I learned through my research. So when you look at this, what does the 80% and 20% represent? So some of you may say the land area is about 20%. No, it's not true. Malay land area is about 30% from my previous slide. So what this means is that the ocean is a very important part of this uh, homeostasis. So the ocean is a carbon dioxide sink. All the carbon dioxide that we produce, the ocean will absorb it. The second important function of the ocean is producing oxygen. So all this oxygen are produced by the phytoplanktons. So these phytoplanktons are key to produce oxygen and that's about 80% of it. So if we contaminate the ocean, the oxygen production will be limited. And some of these scientists who plan for colonization of uh, outer space in Mars and all that, they were thinking about using phytoplanktons to, to colonize this area because Phytoplankton can produce a lot of oxygen. So we must protect the ocean more than the land. But most of the time, we are not even aware what is under the ocean. So we start from you without the five hours. So later I will ask you what is the five hours. Uh, all this uh, rubbish will be accidentally dropped from your hands and uh, drained to the ocean. And you can see that 
research points to two main entry into our human body. We swallow them or we breathe them in. And evidence is showing growing that our food and water is contaminated with uh, microplastics. So this microplastic is also found in a uh, fish meal. So not all the fishes that is uh, caught by a fisherman used for direct consumption. About a quarter of them, because uh, it's a low quality, low economic uh, fish, they convert it to fish meal. So the fish meal are uh, given to the livestock as uh, a protein supplement to, to grow. So when you consume, even though you don't consume fish because of worry about microplastic, the animals like uh, the cows, uh, sheep, pork, I mean the pig, uh, pig and the rest, they consume some of this fish meal and they also consume the plastics. So what the fish eat, you also eat it as well. And the toxic chemicals in plastic uh, the one important thing is that do not reduce your mineral water because it has all these different different chemicals. <clears throat> the first one is uh, tailings, it linked to hormone disruption and reproductive harm to boys. PVC found in plastic and linked to cancer. BPA and BPS are hormone disruptor uh, linked to breast cancer, pubert early puberty, and also infertility. So some of you attending conference, uh, most people, even myself, we. Uh, for convenience, we like to drink from the mineral water. So, you know, mineral water from the mineral bottle, plastic bottle. And it has been shown that uh, the research in uh, in US found that uh, the majority of uh, uh, microplastic that we consume come from bottled water, 94.37 uh, particles. And uh, beer also a lot. Uh, air, also we, we breathe in, tap water and seafood, and these are the smaller amount. So if the ocean has so much microplastic, where does it come from? It comes from the synthetic textile. So if you can, if you have a choice, you have to try to choose uh, the, the natural fiber instead of synthetic fibers. Car tires also contribute a lot to the microplastic, city dust, road markings, marine coatings, and personal care products and plastic pellets. So uh, if you cannot remember anything from my talk, don't drink from um, plastic mineral water. And it takes about 500 years to biodegrade many of these things that we use regularly. Secret bud take about 10 years, plastic bag, 30 years, styrofoam cup about 50 years, and uh, aluminum cans about 200 years, plastic holder about 400 years, and okay, disposable food diaper is also uh, a big uh, usage in the world now plastic bottle and fishing line. So it takes many, many years for it to be destroyed in the ocean. And some of you say that I use the bottles, but I can recycle it. So you must know that when you look at your plastic bottle, only three types of uh, plastic bottle can be recycled properly. Uh, number one, number two, and also number five. The rest cannot be recycled properly. So, so be careful of uh, what you are using because not all can be recycled. So I hope that I raise your curiosity and convince you that uh, this is a big problem and also uh, make you committed to this cause of uh, saving our environment because if we have, do not have a good environment, it, it will also, uh, we do not have a good uh, healthy aging. So I hope all of you know who this is he is uh, ex uh, vice president of, uh, of of US, and he became famous in two thousand and six, uh, and he he speak regularly in the public uh, uh, arena, and also he come up with this uh, documentary say that says an inconvenient truth. So prior to that, for the about seventeen years from nineteen eighty nine, he has been talking about global warming for 17 years. And in 2006, he became very famous because of this documentary. Uh, it can be found in Netflix. And this is a, a documentary talking about global warming. So I want to ask you, he has been talking about this for so long. You know, up to now, it's about 18 years since this uh, documentary came out. But our global warming has not stopped. So what is the problem here? Why, how come uh, a very 
famous and important leader uh, has been raising awareness. And some of you may have watched it, but the, the, the world is still going to the direction of uh, serious uh, global warming. The reason is because this must be uh, 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 a group effect. Just like the bees, they collect a small amount of uh, pollen and also honey, and uh, they convert it to honey. And it takes many, many of these small bees to come up with, uh, with all this honeycomb and honey. So it cannot be a, a single person, a politician, or even a, a very famous uh, person talking about it. It has to be each of us doing our part to, to save the world. And, and, and I, I urge all of you to make some small changes so that uh, it can be better uh, world for our children. So what can you do as an individual? You can reduce your carbon footprint, use uh, public transportation, walks and recycle and all that. So as little public transport as you can. can. Save energy, you will change to LED efficient uh, light bulbs, conserve water, so don't let water leak out. Practice uh, waste reduction. So there are three R's here, reduce, reuse and recycle. But for, I will tell you what is uh, five R's. Support uh, sustainable products, promote uh, renewable energy, plant trees, educate and inspire, vote for the environment, support political candidates that is, uh, that is um, more of uh, environmental protection and also sustainability, and participate in community initiative. So these are things that you can do as a little bee that uh, collect all this uh, honey. Okay. Okay. So a lot of you know about the three R's. So the first one is uh, reduce, minimize your consumption, reuse and repair. So you instead of throwing away, find ways to reuse the item. And the last one is recycle. So I'm sure all of you know about recycling. And even then, not everybody recycle their things. But recycle is the bottom of the five R's. It's the last step of, uh, of the R's. The more important one is, is this, is refuse. So this is number one. Say no to unnecessary or harmful items. Refusing single-use plastic, excessive packaging, and don't buy if you don't use it more than once a week. So a lot of people, they have this uh, urge to buy new things. And uh, the second one is let it rot. So rot means uh, composting. You So a lot of people compost their, their organic waste, but you must compost it in an aerobic way. So this is what I spoke about, about the paddy fields. When it's covered with water, it's anaerobic. So when you compost, ideally it should be uh, decay with oxygen. So you compost uh, your food scrap and all that, and and also uh, that will help the world. So refuse is number one. And these are some of the plastic packaging material in 2013, they did the study and found that majority of this uh, plastic material, 40% goes to the landfill, 32% leakage to the land and also to the ocean, and 14% go to the incineration. And out of this, this amount, only 14% are collected for recycling. So of this plastic that is collected for recycling, 4% are lost, and 8% are cascaded recycling, and 2% are closed-loop recycling. What does it mean? 2% closed-loop recycling means that you produce equally uh, value type of uh, plastic. So what it means that uh, in the, you recycle into plastic that is similar in terms of uh, usage. The cascaded recycling means that you recycle into things that are lower in, in value. So food choices is also one of the steps that you can do to, to help the world. So a plant-based diet, so I spoke about 51% of the global warming gases come from ruminants. So we try not to eat so much of the beef and lamb. It's associated with higher emission and deforestation. 
local and seasonal foods, reduce your carbon footprint, organic foods, avoid, avoid synthetic uh, pesticide, reduce uh, food waste. So refuse. So if you cannot eat so much, don't take so much of uh, uh, food. And uh, water footprint, eco-friendly uh, packaging, sustainable practices, and GMO consideration. So all these uh, things that you can do, but the stronger ones, we cannot do everything. We, have, we try to eat more plant-based diet and cut down on beef and lamb because of the rumination that produce a lot of uh, methane. So if some of you here can understand what I have been telling you, and you said that, and is there anyone that can guide or teach me on how to make it better? Uh, I want to introduce to the uh, NGO that I'm involved in. So not all of you have to join this NGO, but you, there are many other people who are doing uh, some of this good work in the, that help our environment. So I want to show you this video. So that's uh, Tsuji, it's a, it's a Buddhist organization. And one of the core uh, pillars of their activities are uh, recycling. So as I said, recycling is a final part of the firehouse. And many of the volunteers are not paid. And this, are, this is a 80 year old auntie. So she, she kept herself busy by uh, recycling uh, some of these things from her community. So this recycling, you can see that she's squatting down, she's bending over. These are good exercise uh, that, that, that is good for elderly patient. And also uh, give her a purpose of, of, of living and using a physical body to the maximum. So I also want to uh, share my, my struggle. I was a meat eater, but I'm a WFPB, is a whole food plant-based promoter. So as I promote this type of uh, diet, I was also eating meat. So it's a it's an identity crisis for me, and and sometimes I feel embarrassed that I'm doing this. So it was a, a struggle and also the guilt of uh, emotional cravings because since young I eat a lot of this uh, nice food made from uh, animal uh, meat versus their sufferings, and I understand. The reason for eating this is good for my health and I understand the environmental reason uh, for eating this type of food. But all these are not strong enough to overcome my emotional cravings. But for the last one year, I have a, a, a change because I know that it's the animals, it's their, it's their feeling and their universal needs of comfort, fear and happiness and love. They are no different from you and me as a species. So I want to show you the next uh, video. Some of these animals here are the common animals that we consume. The poultry, the chicken, the ducks, the geese, the, the pigs, the, the cow and the, and the sheep. So all of them have the same sort of emotion that all of us have. So I hope that you can uh, Look at this, and you may if you may look at the source. The source is on top of this video. So all these video come from different different sources, and you can. Sorry. I'll go back. Yeah. <laughs> 
So Dr. James Hansen is a professor of Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences, head of NASA Institute of Space Studies. He said that we have exceeded the tipping level, but we have not reached the point of no return, which is about 1.5 degrees Celsius. So it's not too late, too late for us to do something. And all of us must make small changes. And the block and band output from the AI uh, of the question of the prompt, what is the solution to save Earth? So you can guess uh, what is the answer that was banned. So nobody can go back and start a new beginning because our forefathers have done something. But anyone can start today and make a new ending. So I hope all of you can do something. And if all mankind were to disappear, the world would regenerate back to the rich state of equilibrium, the homeostasis that existed 10,000 years ago. If insects were to vanish, the environment would collapse into chaos. So with that, uh, I have uh, completed my... I think there's no, um, no immediate question from all of you. Uh, I'm not a scientist in environment, but the data they are presented is more uh, a lot of them that is in public domain and, and you can actually uh, Google them. And hopefully you make the first step of um, of uh, doing the firehouse, you know, uh, refuse, uh, make it rot, and reuse, repair, and also finally recycle. And choose, choose uh, the diet that is good for our world. Uh, for a better world. So with that, I thank all of you for your attention and uh, I'll see you in next month. So next month uh, is a talk that is not related to healthcare. I invited uh, a very uh, important uh, special person. Uh, it's actually uh, a story of, a, of, a, of, a, of someone uh, in the past that has contributed to our nation building. So with that, I will stop here and thank you for your attention. Bye-bye.